friends, would you pray with me? O Holy One, take our mouths and speak with them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hands and work with them. And take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and all of creation. Amen. I do hope and pray your first week of spring has sprung, or at least beginning to spring. 110 years ago today, solidarity began to blossom. On March 27, 1912, two cherry trees were planted along the Potomac, the Potomac River Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. by two powerful women, the First Lady Helen Heron Taft and the Viscountess Chinda, wife of the Japanese ambassador. Now, this poignant sign of friendship between nations is now celebrated annually in D.C. as the Cherry Blossom Festival. Festival. I hope some of you, like I, have been there and been blessed by those incredible bursts of energy and light and color and smell those natural masterpieces in the center of our country's politic. And the solidarity that has weathered the many storms that surround these now 3,770 gifted trees that line the DC memorials adds far more to their beauty than just their blossoms. This planting 110 years ago was actually the second planting for two years earlier, 2,000 trees were donated by the mayor of Tokyo to D.C., but sadly thereafter died of disease. So in 1912, after some 10 years, by the way, of advocacy from women in D.C., 3,000 more were sent. And then World War II happened, and once friends became suddenly enemies, the United States and Japan, Hiroshima, Nagasaki unimaginable suffering because of weapons and intent upon the innocent. Thousands of cherry trees were destroyed in Tokyo during the Allied bombing raids, but just after the storm quelled, U.S. horticulturalists bravely took cuttings from these Washington trees and sent them back across the Pacific as a sign of a new peace that may one day emerge between these nations. And in turn, years later, decades later, when the trees in D.C. began to die, Tokyo did the same and sent cuttings to be replanted in Washington. Friends, in the midst of the storms of diseased trees and the disease of war, the power of showing up in solidarity blooms large. We all know the power showing up. When a child is being bullied and another child shows up in solidarity to stop it. When hundreds of Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate signs go, in a, go up suddenly in a particular neighborhood in solidarity. When in the face of a shameful repeated theft of books from an LGBTQ free library here in Waltham, hundreds of neighbors donate thousands of dollars to buy hundreds more books to stock the shelves. When the Russian newscaster holds up a handmade sign saying stop the war in Ukraine in powerful resistance to Russian empire that continues to spew lies. When the presidents of Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovenia take a train into Kyiv as bombs rain down on Ukraine, the people's grottos, bomb shelters, when millions of unnamed Ukrainians, Russians, and Poles open up their homes and lives to refugees, including animals, to counter Putin's hatred. And closer to home, when Senator Cory Booker shows up in a powerful way in solidarity with Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, in light of white supremacy's storm, seen and heard in the questioning of extremist senators as patronizing, misogynistic, racist, and rude commentary is spewed for sound bites over Twitter. 
I want to remain and linger on this one for a moment because of its historicity and poignancy. Booker greeted Jackson, I hope you heard this, and if not, please find its YouTube clip, with a broad smile saying, your family and you speak to service, 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 and I'm telling you right now, I'm not letting anyone in the Senate, any haters, steal my joy. I just look at you and I start getting full of emotion. You didn't get here because of some dark money groups. You got here how every black woman in America who's gotten anywhere has done by being like Ginger Rogers said, I did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards in heels. And so I'm just sitting here saying, nobody's stealing my joy. No one's going to make me angry. Senator Booker went on one more to say to Judge Jackson, I see my ancestors and yours, and no one's going to steal our joy. Friends, there is cherry blossom beauty power in showing up for others, especially in the midst of storming seas. In today's scripture reading, read so well by Evans, our uh, par excellence B, uh, BU student here in our midst, the prophet Elijah experiences the power of someone showing up in the midst of the storm. High up on that mountain of Horeb or Sinai, as Elijah hides scared in a cave, God shows up. And although Isaiah, I, Elijah, although Elijah may be experiencing his own stormy night, God shows up not in that which is scary, overwhelming, or flashy. God shows up not in the wind. God, show, God shows up not in the earthquake, not in the fire. God shows up, as we know well, in the sheer silence, in the subtle, in the still in the kol dama daka, a fine silence, the Hebrew indicates. And it is there where Elijah encounters God. I know I'm not alone and long loving this story from our Hebrew Bible, from our original testament. And I cannot get enough of those reminders that God shows up when we are most still. We need to quiet ourselves and the worries of the world around us in hope of encountering the divine, to hear the quiet intimations of God's love in that still, quiet voice. That's why last year for Lent, we centered on stilling ourselves and tuning in to our breath. There, understanding we meet God. And this Lent, recognizing that in the grotto, in those quiet, sacred spaces, in those maybe Places least in the glimmer and spotlight, those places sometimes forgotten by the world, there, residing in God's presence, we hear the voice of God, and we become more still knowing that God is God. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, may his memory be a blessing, makes the point for all of us. Dear children of God, all of us are meant to be contemplatives. Frequently, as we assume this is reserved for some rare monastic life lived by special folks alone who have been called by God. But the truth of the matter is that each of us is want, meant to have that space inside where we can hear God's voice. God is available to us all, and each of us wants and needs to give ourselves space for quiet. So fellow contemplatives, how is your Lent going? Are you finding time to carve out stillness amidst all the noise, all the war, all the unsettledness of these days? Time to simply be. Every Lent we need this enjoinder to make time. It does not come to us naturally. We have to carve it out. Some of us are given it more than others at different chapters in our lives. Take what is given and lean into it. Lauren Starr, who led us, my dear cousin, last year in learning how to breathe more regularly in our worship services, has been giving me the gift of weekly yoga sessions with her. And one of her homework assignments, do not, I, this is not being recorded, no one's listening, don't tell Lauren this, I have not been doing my homework. She has been instructing me to simply breathe, the, the, the exchanging the, the nostrils back and forth, the rotating nostrils. I have to find that, I have to say that is really hard. It is hard to find and make the time to simply breathe 
And I'm trying to preach this, and it's really hard for me to live this. But I have a partner and someone who's helping me guide the way. If you need that, seek it out, friends. Find someone who can remind you to breathe. For I believe when we do carve at that time, when we do get into those grottos, we may be changed by the presence of God. I wonder what Elijah heard up in that cave grotto, in that elevated space, in those echo chambers of the silent, solid walls of the earth. And perhaps before we get that, we can remind ourselves of the question, why is Elijah up on Mount Sinai in the first place? A question that is actually repeated twice in our section of verses today. What are you doing here, Elijah? God asks Elijah not once, but twice. What are you doing up here in a mountain cave, cowering from something in the heart of the wilderness? What has led you to this point? God is asking Elijah. And I admit it's easy for us to miss the point of this text, which we cherish so much about silence and seeking God, but the backstory is equally important. For we have landed in this 10th so-called book of the Hebrew Scriptures, 1 Kings chapter 19, and we encounter Elijah, the Tishbite, the Tishbite from Gilead, whose name means, my God is Yahweh. Now this famous Hebrew Deuteronomistic prophet emerges after the reigns of, of David and Solomon in the northern kingdom of Israel, in the reign of King Ahab in the 9th century BCE. And he lives up to his namesake. He is a not, he's not a fan of people worshiping any other gods but Yahweh. So much so that he calls them out repeatedly in a vocation that winds him up facing down 450 priests of Baal in a whose god is more powerful than whose showdown. And because Yahweh lights the fire under Elijah's sacrificial bonfire and the false prophets of Baal's pyre remains unlit, Elijah wins. And as part of this deal, the 450 priests lose not only the showdown, but their lives at the hand of Elijah, the text says. And this makes, the Je this makes Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab, super unhappy, as these happen to be her priests. And so she sends a clear message to Elijah that within 24 hours, you too will meet a similar fate. And this is where we meet Elijah, on the run, running fast and scared. I don't know if you noticed yesterday, there were a lot of people along Calm Ave running their long run in preparation for Boston's Marathon the day after Easter on Patriots Day. They were doing some 20 miles just a few weeks out from the 24 miles. But many of them were running backwards down from Boston through Calm Ave all the way down Heartbreak Hill. I saw them yesterday. Elijah, too, is running in reverse. He was repeating the footsteps of Moses who liberated the people out from the wilderness into the promised land, and Elijah is moving from the promised land, running back into the same Sinai wilderness. He's retracing steps already led forth. It's as if Elijah's fear is leading him back into the bondage that Moses previously had helped liberate the people from. This binding fear and exhaustion leads Elijah to the lowest of lows, despite the mountainous elevation attained, and he becomes clinically depressed and suicidal, the text says. But in re reaching this extreme rock bottom where fear threatens to overwhelm, there is sudden provision, and not once but twice God's angels arrive with nourishment that sustains getting get up and eat, Elijah, otherwise the journey will be far too much for you. There is real fear, but there is real food. A scared Elijah is nourished along the way, nourishment in the midst of the storms. And we've often heard people lifting, and me included, that there have been silver linings to this pandemic. We've also heard lots of people saying there is no such thing as a silver lining in the midst of a global catastrophe. So I like the idea of nourishment in the midst of a storm. Friends, there has been nourishment time and time again in the midst of a COVID pandemic as families and people have leaned in closer together, spent more time together, less time commuting, more time rethinking and reprioritizing what is most important. The great quit has seen a lot of people get out of jobs that have been oppressive 
and be freed up to more of what God may be calling them to and society owes of them. We have limited hours and weeks and months in our lives. And a reframing of what is most important in our lives is central to our life of faith. And I believe God's voice often asks of us to ask the question, what am I doing here? So how do we know the sound of God's voice? How do we know what it sounds and, 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 and tastes and, and, and feels like in our lives? Spending more time in silence, being still, is one way to engage that. But those storms are real. The air sirens are real. The white rage veiled as national politic is real. Voting rights constantly and strategically dismantled. It's real. The storms rage. And sometimes, like Elijah, it is so easy to get so stuck and stopped and stymied by their fury that we forget to seek God's presence. But in the power of solidarity and showing up, there is the hope of breaking free. There is the power of change. Now, Elijah here does not emerge from the grotto on Sinai the same as he enters it. The one who is nourished by the angels receives a significant redirect from that still small voice. Elijah, what are you doing here? God whispers. And notice Elijah at first does not get it. That grotto encounter with God does not seem to change him. He replies the same way as he does before the, the, the sacred silence, as one being centered on someone being zealous for God. He brags at how he alone has been faithful, even to the point of violence against the priests of Baal, thinking that God perhaps is pleased by that work. But God seemed to have other plans. The small and still voice does not condone this violent, zealous behavior, but redirects. Go, Elijah, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, go anoint Hazael as king over Aram. God effectively replies, Elijah, I have another plan for you, not to go back the same way you came, but to go through Damascus, to go on a journey to a new place you will not go back the same way as you came. We learn later in this chapter that on his way to Damascus, Elijah is further called by God to anoint a farmer named Elisha as his successor. The still small voice brings big, active change. Without saying these words, the silence speaks volumes. I, Yahweh, whose name and image you bear, am not interested in how zealous you are. I'm not interested in you killing others to defend my name. What I want people to know is that I am the great provider, the one who nourishes. I may not be the one who takes away your fears or wilderness experiences, but I will be with you during those storms. I will be with you even when you run from the things that scare you. I will show up when you are most afraid, and I will lead you into a new way. So for Elijah, the grotto experience is not just a place of protection, but a place of redirection. Friends, might the still small voice be calling you into a new direction? We are all in different chapters in our lives. Some in college, ready to discern a new way forward from college out into career to vocation. Others of us in a more silent place, having years of lived experience before us. Some of us just newborns, like we, we met last Sunday in church, Austin and Caitlin's newborn, Lucien. Friends, all of us have the invitation to listen to the redirection that God has for us, for what is next. Nothing is pre-scripted. Whatever days we have left, all is left open to choice and to God's presence. And I pray that we, like Elijah, would listen and not be afraid. Another powerful image of solidarity and showing up we saw this past week was when President Biden showed up in Europe and, and shared a powerful speech in Poland. The very first words, sharing the exact same words that Pope John Paul II, that Polish Pope, first shared when he was first inaugurated as Pope, do not be afraid. 
into the voice of things that are scary, this idea of protecting the voiceless and allowing the people's voice to rise up over tyranny was one our world needs to hear, very much so in our own country as our voting rights continue to be assailed and attacked as the very freedom for people to vote and to have their voices heard is assailed in many ways, not just in Ukraine, but here at home. So friends, may we hear that voice, do not be afraid in the facing of our fears, in the facing of all that is uncertain in these days. And may we hear the chant, the storm rages, peace be still. And in this, I invite us to go ahead and get in our way. Let's not obstruct ourselves from what God is calling us to, but get in our way, which is indeed, truly, when it is right, also God's way, God's leading. Get into our path, get into our vocation, get in to where God is calling us. And so it makes sense for us to continue our singing in our worship as we next will sing, Be Still My Soul. And this verse stands out. For God will undertake to guide in future days as in the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be clear at last. Amen.